I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our USDA experts. So thank you so much for joining us today. Take it away. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, can you guys see me yeah. or uh, hear me? Let's see. Sounds great. Thank you. So we're going to do from beginning. All right, you guys should be able to see the slides now. Yeah, actually, um, Trace, I think that you, if you can put it into presentation mode, because right now we see your notes. Oh, let's see. How do I do that? This one. How about that one? Perfect. Okay, excellent. So, hi, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about uh, one of the world's worst fruit and vegetable pests, fruit flies, and how the USDA combats the threat and keeps our food production safe from millions of wriggling maggots. My name is Trace Harden. I work for the United States Department of Agriculture. I began my career with this agency actually fighting fruit flies. Uh, now I work for a pest risk assessment laboratory, laboratory where we try to implement ways to fight pests, insects, and diseases from our farms and forests. The USDA has taken me all over the United States to help combat invasive pests like emerald ash borer, exotic snails, and more. But before starting with the federal service, my mom recognized that I loved bugs and other creepy crawlies when I was a little kid, so she actually enrolled me in the local zoo's volunteer program. This is a great opportunity that set me on a path to work in zoos for almost a decade and led me to pursue an entomology, entomology as a career. If you're interested in this field, maybe you should look into North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences internship volunteer opportunities. And now we'll talk about flies. So when many people hear the name fruit flies, they think of those tiny flies that buzz around our weak old bananas. The name barely conjures more than a thought of annoyance, but there are two different families of fruit flies, that, or there are two different families of flies that go by the fruit fly name. The Drosophilidae family, the flies we commonly see in our kitchens, are attracted to the alcohol in fermenting fruit. This family is usually harmless and found almost everywhere in the world. On the other hand, the family of fruit flies called Tephridides, commonly called Tephridids, are a much bigger threat. Tephridids are practically non-existent in the United States. They are one of the most destructive fruit fly pests in the world. They are very pretty though. Most are wasp, many of them are wasp mimics. Entomologists have actually described over 5,000 different species of tephridids. The adults themselves aren't fruit pests, but females lay bunches of eggs into fresh fruits and vegetables before they are picked for our grocery stores and farmers markets. These eggs hatch into maggots that feed inside the produce unnoticed until we slice them open or take a bite. So the reason to fritted fruit flies are such serious pests is because of their predilection to attack fresh fruits and vegetables that are growing in the field. Many insects are pretty specific about what they will eat. This is called their host range. To fritted maggots have a wide host range and can feed inside hundreds of different types of fruits and vegetables. Another feature that makes to fritids unlike other flies is their ovipositor. Now, only female insects have ovipositors, and they usually use them to lay eggs. Tephridids have a sharp ovipositor, and they can use it to pierce fruit and vegetable flesh. And this allows the females to lay dozens of eggs inside your oranges and peppers and berries and all kinds of other fruits and veggies. Fruit fly infestations are serious and cost billions of dollars in lost produce. Entire farms can shut down due to these terrible pests. If egg laying conditions are perfect, some species of female tephridids can lay 50 eggs a day. Once the adults lay eggs in your food, maggots quickly hatch. Unfortunately, you can't tell that maggots take up, have taken up residence in your fruit until you slice it open or they're ready to pupate and they leave the fruit. Since the larvae are so sneaky, they can escape detection and travel to new countries and fruits and vegetables there is always the risk of new fruit fly infestations popping up in the United States. Now the maggots feed inside the fruit or vegetables unnoticed until they're ready to become adult flies. Imagine biting into an orange full of maggots. This used to be the reality here in the United States until the USDA and state agricultural agencies put a lot of work into their eradication. As mentioned, there are nearly 5,000 species of tephridid fruit flies. 
but the two species that are of particular concern for the United States are the Mediterranean fruit fly and the Mexican fruit fly. The Mexican fruit fly is a damaging pest in the United States and Central America. Notice that females long ovipositor for injecting eggs into fruit. The USDA estimates that Mexican fruit flies caused $1.44 billion worth of damage in only a five year span. The Mexican fruit fly is originally from Guatemala and Southern Mexico. But in the early 1900s, the fly was introduced to Southern Texas where it spread quickly through citrus fruit groves citrus fruit groves into Florida, California, and Arizona. Luckily, the United States and Mexico's agricultural departments were successful in pushing this species out of major fruit and vegetable production areas. They maintain a quarantine boundary around these farms so that future fly infestations won't threaten our food supply. So the Mediterranean fruit fly or med fly can attack over 300 different species of fruits and vegetables. The Mediterranean fruit fly is originally from Africa, but is spread through much of the world. The species is a serious pest in both Central and South America, Australia, Southern Europe, parts of Asia, and Hawaii. If the med fly were to become established here, consumer prices would go up and produce would become less available. Also, pesticide use would increase in backyard gardens and commercial farms. The estimated annual market value of U.S. commodities that could host exotic fruit flies is more than $7.2 billion. Now that dollar figure is the sum of potential damage to our nation's economy from export sanctions, lost markets, treatment costs, reduced crop yields, plant deformities, and premature fruit drop. Medfly was first introduced to the mainland of North America in 1929. Notice all that fruit that dropped off the trees in this old photo? This is a typical sign of a fruit fly infestation. Most of the fruit flies the USDA is concerned about controlling are from other countries. We call them invasive species when they are here. Since we grow miles and miles of their favorite food and there are no native predators to keep them in check, a lot of fruit fly species spread quickly and become very serious pests. Every fruit and vegetable they attack has to be thrown away because it is contaminated with maggots. In the middle of the 1900s, Florida's fruit and vegetable production was hit hard by the Mediterranean fruit fly. In some parts of Florida, schools were even canceled so children could go help farmers protect fruits and vegetables by tying paper bags around them. Trucks, aircrafts, and people have used insecticide sprays to combat fruit fly outbreaks over the years, including as recently as 1989 when insecticides were sprayed from helicopters all over Los Angeles, California. While insecticides are excellent at eradicating invasive fruit flies, they can cause a lot of ecological damage. Americans realized many decades ago that spraying poisons into the environment can cause more problems than it fixes. Since insecticides are indiscriminate killers, what the fight against fruit flies needs is a targeted approach that will specifically eradicate and keep out just the fruit fly pests. And that's where the idea of the sterile insect technique came in. It's basically fruit fly birth control. During the atomic age of the 1950s, the entomologist Edward Nippling and his team began experimenting with population dynamics of insects by releasing sterilized individuals. Nippling realized that some species of female flies only reproduce once. Therefore, if she mated with a sterile male fruit fly, scientists could break the reproduction cycle of an insect, break the breeding cycle and prevent new flies from entering the population and you can eradicate the population of a specific type of insect from an area. Using the sterile insect technique, males of both Mexican and Mediterranean fruit flies are reared in large quantities in laboratories, sterilized with a small amount of radiation and released from airplanes or by the ground into host areas where they mate with wild fruit flies. The females lay on fertilized eggs and do not produce offspring. Eventually, the wild population is eliminated through attrition. SIT is most effective against low-level uh, fruit fly populations, where it is possible to achieve a high proportion of sterile to wild flies. The targeted sterile insect approach to combat pests is environmentally friendly, cheaper and safer than the alternatives, and creates lots of jobs nationally and internationally. In addition, unlike pesticides, where the smaller the population is, uh, they start building resistance to the toxins, sterile insect technique works better as the population shrinks. So the main problem with the sterile insect technique is that an area must maintain a 10 to 1 population of sterile males for every fertile male. If 
too many male, too many fertile males are able to breed with the females, the system will crash and your pest population will go back up. That's why the USDA created sterile insect release facilities in areas of high risks of infestation. So Florida's sterile insect release facility, for example, imports a hundred million sterilized male fruit flies from a Guatemalan fly rearing facility every week. That's almost 400 pounds of flies every week. It's crazy. In these photos, you can see the flies are imported as pupa. The pupa are dyed red or yellow and they glow under a black light. We'll explain the importance of that soon. 99% of female flies are sorted out in the Guatemalan rearing facility and left there using temperature specific water baths. Once the males are here at the sterile insect release facility, we raise these sterilized males, uh, med flies, in a tower system that is composed of 70 individual trays, and each tray houses 25,000 pupa that will emerge as flies in the following few days. Each tray is offered a sugar jello as a breakfast for these freshly emerged flies. It usually takes about a week until they're ready to go. Um, so after a week in the tower enclosures, the adult male flies are ready to fly. Every day, numerous towers are moved into giant refrigerators where the flies go into a dormancy so that technicians can load them into an airplane hopper. And each flight releases over 5 million flies. That's almost 80 pounds of flies dropped from an airplane. Let's see. We use twin engine turbine airplanes to release the flies at an altitude of 2,000 feet. The chilled flies are still asleep when they are dropped from the airplane. However, the warm air quickly awakens them so that they can disperse from a high altitude and immediately go looking for any female flies that might be in the area. Remember, we have to dump all of these males into high risk areas every day so that the sterile males are always present in 10 to one ratio. That means even when there are no female fruit flies around, we never know when someone might accidentally bring a hitchhiking fertile female into the United States. That is why we always ask people not to move fruits and vegetables over country borders. When the weather is not cooperating, sterile insect technicians will release flies from a custom made truck. This truck is carrying the 80 pound box of sleeping fruit flies and connected to a leaf blower engine. With the flip of a switch, we can blow thousands of fruit flies from the side of a vehicle. I've gotten, I've ridden around in these trucks. It is so fun on release day. You feel like you're in the Batmobile when you switch that, uh, that switch. So, and technology, of course, is always improving. We're now assessing the feasibility of releasing flies from unmanned aerial drones. So to ensure the success of this decades long project, the USDA and state agricultural agencies work together to monitor fruit fly traps all over high risk areas both states. The traps use pheromones and bait attractants to trap both our sterile male fruit flies and any others that could be in the area. Once the traps are set, they're checked every few weeks. If any dead flies are found, they are delivered to our fruit fly lab. Remember the, few, the fruit flies came in dyed red with a powder that glows in their black light? Well, the adult flies still have remnants of this dye in their exoskeleton. This is an easy way for lab techs to identify the sterile males. If fertile flies are found, we will hang more traps and possibly release more sterile males in that area to drive the population down. Luckily, in North Carolina, the risk of exotic fruit flies is low because of our cold winters. However, we still ask not to move fruits and vegetables over state and country borders. Do not bring or mail fresh fruits, vegetables, or plants into your state or another state unless agricultural inspectors clear them first. When returning from international travel, declare all agricultural products to U.S. customs officials and never remove fresh produce from your property if your area is under quarantine. And always allow authorized agricultural workers access to your property to install and inspect insect collecting traps. So with that, thank you all for your time. I'm able to answer questions now or we can hold them till the end. But uh, I'm excited to hear from Jennifer and Josh. So yeah, let's hit. We have a whole list of questions. So let's hit a few of them. Let's hit a few of them now. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I've been taking notes. So um, so uh, Sophie and Amelia want to know: um, Do they have preferences of fruit? Like, what's their? I think maybe what's their favorite fruit? Yeah, there's uh, all kinds. Uh, their favorite fruit really are citrus. That's probably their favorites. 
Um, but I mean, they'll attack just all kinds of stuff, other vegetables, even um, like uh, algae and black sooty mold that will grow on trees. I mean, these, these flies will just eat anything. That's why they're just so destructive. All right, and then Ruxin wanted to know, why did one of the flies have green eyes, but the others had black eyes? That's all species variation. So remember I said there's 5,000 different types of uh, just the tephridid fruit flies. There's even way more other flies, but some have red eyes, some have rainbow colored eyes, and it's just all about that, that species. Okay, and Laura Beth wants to know, would we get sick if we ate the maggots? Not that she wanted to. She just wanted to know um, like, what would happen. As someone that has occasionally eaten some bugs, we probably wouldn't get sick. Uh, it would just be a little bit of extra protein in our breakfast, I think. So nothing too terrible, but I think it's mostly the shock value. So. All right. And then um, Laura Beth also wanted to know, how do scientists or lab technicians irradiate the flies without being harmed by the radiation? So it's this huge process and they actually do it in Guatemala where they rear all these flies. And we do rear some sterile flies here in the United States, but they just have a much better facility there. Um, and no, it's just a big machine that they basically run the pupa through and it just uh, kind of shoots it with a little tiny bit of a radiation. Probably no different than what, you know, if you go to the dentist and get your uh, teeth uh, x-rayed, that's sort of the same idea that they're doing. Okay, and I have a question. So are there any natural predators or are they, or no, because they're invasive? So there are native predators in their habitat, you know, birds, lizards, all kinds of stuff. And they typically will keep them in check in small numbers. But because we've completely transformed the landscape to benefit humans and we've planted so many uh, hosts and fruit trees and stuff like that, um, the fruit flies just can reproduce so much faster than even the predators can keep them down. So even here in the United States, there's plenty of stuff that eat these flies. And even when I worked at the sterile insect release facility, every day when we were cleaning the, all the towers and everything, there'd always inevitably be some flies that were able to stick to the, uh, to the trays and stuff like that. And all the birds knew at the specific time that we'd start washing, they'd start like circling and swooping down. It was so fun to watch. You'd see all kinds of cool species of birds. It was, it was neat. That's, that is really neat. Yeah, I think it's so amazing great. how yeah. they can, wildlife learns. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. Okay, so the Williams family wants to know, do they bite? No, this species does not bite. And I should have made reference, that ovipositor that they use to um, lay their eggs. Now, some insects will use their ovipositor to sting bees and wasps. That's actually, that's like their stinger, basically. But fruit flies can't sting. They just, they just sting fruit, so. Okay, um, and then that really, really ties in nicely to the next question is how do, how do they lay eggs? So uh, remember that little ovipositor, only the females have that. And they basically use it as a little stylet and they just stick it right into the, uh, right into the fruit and they'll lay a few eggs in each fruit. They'll, they'll test all the fruits. So one female can lay 50 eggs. A lot of those might be in one or two fruits, but they very easily can just go fruit to fruit to fruit to fruit. So one fly can ruin, you know, a whole bushel of uh, oranges or anything like that. Um, and then um, Ayotana wants to know, uh, will the fruit fly um, mutate with the radiation? Is there a possibility of that? Probably not. Uh, this is a different kind of a radiation. So basically this just destroys um, the sex cells and makes them uh, sterile. So it's not going, unfortunately, it's not going to make a, a giant super fly. As much as I would love to see that, uh, it's not going to make anything like that. So. And a lot of our um, fruits and vegetables from other country are also treated with irradiation just in case there's any kinds of weird bugs or anything like that, um, microscopic stuff. So a lot of stuff that we buy at the grocery store is even treated with irradiation or hot water baths or, something like, or stuff like that. It's completely harmless to humans. All right. And so I think that you know, we had another question about what kind of fruit they don't like. And Josh told us the answer. It's lemons. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Anything super sour, yeah. Right. All right. I think that's it for our question. So right. let's okay. talk about some dogs. Yeah, let's see. So I stopped sharing. Perfect. Okay. Oh, there's the chat. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, you can't see the chat when you share your screen. Uh, or it's really it. hard. It's really hard to see it.
See how that works. All right. Can everybody see the K-19s of the USDA? I can. See you great. Awesome. Hi, I'm Josh. Um, my name is Josh Moose. I'm a PBQ officer with the USDA and a canine handler. And welcome to the National Detector Dog Training Center portion of the presentation. This is where we're gonna talk about dogs. I know everybody's excited and everybody clicks on the link. They're like, oh, they see that dog with the cool goggles and that's what we're here for. Um, as you can see on the screen right here, we have uh, our current two domestic canine programs. We have Rudy, which is an English Springer Spaniel. And we have Bo, which is a Black Labrador Retriever. And this is our training center located in Noonan, Georgia, where we uh, train and teach them how to do their jobs. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, go ahead. Yep. Feel free to put it in the chat and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Or if we have really super important questions, we can always stop and ask them. Um, now we're going to go over to uh, Officer Jen. And she's going to tell us a little bit about what uh, plant protection officers do. Hi, I'm Jennifer Taylor, and I also am a PPQ officer and canine handler for the USDA. And the United States Department of Agriculture is what the USDA stands for. It was created by Abraham Lincoln, who was our president, to safeguard the food supply of America. We watch over the health of America's agriculture, so we protect the food. The USDA employees are civil servants. That means we work for the government of the United States to serve the people. We protect America's animals and plants from invasive pests and diseases. What Josh and I do as PPQ officers based out of the National Detector Dog Training Center, also called the NDDTC, is we travel with our dogs to different parts of the country to work on detecting invasive insect infestations. The USDA will identify invasive animals that the dogs could help to detect, and then they ask our team at the NDDTC to train dogs on that specific pest. It's an exciting and a challenging job, and we're currently the only two PPQ officer and dog handlers who get to do it out of the NDDTC. And now Josh is going to tell us more about the specific dogs at the center and their work that we train them to do. So first off, everyone's question now is always, where do we get our dogs from? We get them from rescues, shelters, and vendors who breed working dogs. Uh, we use many breeds, including Labs, Beagles, uh, this cute little guy right here, Jack the Russell Terrier, and Springer Spaniels, just like Rudy. Um, the Dog Training Center has trained uh, dog and handler teams all over the United States. Uh, which are safeguarding America's agriculture and natural resources from harmful pests and diseases, like Jen said previously. Some of these include the coconut and our rhinoceros beetle, which, you know, they damage the coconut trees, and we don't want those damaged because we all like coconuts. Um, and then there's the gi African giant snails in Florida, which carry very dangerous diseases, and then also damaging rodents like the nutria in Maryland. Um, so a couple of our dogs you can see here is this one beautiful uh, gold lab is looking for the brown marmorated stink bugs in the snow. It's the little stink bugs I know we have here in Georgia and somewhere in North Carolina and some in Tennessee, where if you squish them, they kind of smell a little bit. Um, and then next to that, we have one of the training specialists here is actually training her dog to look for the giant African snails down in Florida. Then we have the majestic beagle Yes, he is working where you'll see them in the airports and then at the seaports. They're looking for agricultural that um, Trace had talked about when people bring it overseas and bring it to the U.S. that we want to make sure we're not, you know, having any of that. Then we've got Joe, which is actually teaching one of the beagles. He's searching for the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, and then we have this beautiful lab. It's not Bo, but he is covered in mud and going after his ball because he is actually looking for nutria scat. And it's actually nutria. So the dog finds that and then they find where the, the nutria live and then he gets his treat. Then like I said, we have the Jack Russell Terrier, which goes, uh, it's out in Guam as the biggest part of them is they look for the brown tree snakes. And then you have a handler out in Hawaii with her dog and she's signaling that she has a uh, target for the um, coconut rhinoceros beetle. Now our program dogs go through a rigorous selection process. We take only the best dogs for these special projects. We look at about an average of 20 dogs for just one project. And out of those 20 dogs, about two to four dogs pass to go to the next portion of the selection process. Now out of those two to four, about one to two pass the medical, physical, and mental portions of the evaluation. We found that many of the best detector dogs 
are those who are usually bored or kind of destructive at home and just need something to constantly do. We look for that high energy dogs who might be not so great as pets, but it's because they need that job and they need something to do to keep their time occupied. And we provide that for, so they can pass it. And now let's talk a little bit about our teams. Now on the left, you can see Officer Taylor with her canine bow. He's such a lovely boy. And then we've got myself with good old Rudy. And you know what? Let's find out a little bit more about Officer Jen. So like I said before, I'm Jen and I'm a plant protection quarantine officer and canine handler. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I got to where I am just like Trace did. I grew up in Sweden where I spent my childhood playing in the woods and I developed a love for wildlife in the outdoors. And in high school, I decided to go into biology in order to help protect the environment. I have a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Forest Biology from the State University of New York at Syracuse where I studied the sciences of wildlife management and animal behavior. And I was lucky enough to get an internship at a zoo because of one of my college professors. The photo of me with a Canada goose is from college when I helped out with a waterfowl banding project. And we actually had to drive those geese all the way across a very large lake with canoes. And you can't see how exhausted I am there, but I'm very, very tired. After college, I spent 14 years as a zookeeper. And I've worked for several zoos, including the Utica Zoo and Disney's Animal Kingdom. I was a sea lion trainer and I even trained native animals like porcupines and skunks to perform with Pocahontas for Disney's Animal Kingdom in Florida. While there, I got to hang out with cool people like Judy Hopps and Pluto. You can see a photo there of me and Judy Hopps. She is the coolest. And for the last 10 years, uh, I worked with detector dogs trained to find many things, including explosives, rats, and insects. In the top right photo, you can see my German Shepherd Caro, who was hanging out with Pluto, and he was an explosives detector dog. Carl and I had a lot of fun as part of the Walt Disney World Security Canine Unit. And in my spare time, I work my personal dogs in dog sports like agility and barn hunt. So you can also see some pictures of my Akitas doing what they love, which is tracking and lure coursing. What I love about my job is that I get the freedom to do the work that I'm passionate about and I get to play with dogs. The center picture on top, or I'm sorry, the center picture here is one of our program beagles that looked for insects. And he was a real fun guy and he was happy enough to model that tie for me that day. And now we're gonna turn it over to Josh. I like Jen, uh, my name is Josh. I am a PPQ officer, canine handler. Uh, I was a US Marine for 10 years where I was a canine officer, uh, trainer and kennel master. Uh, I traveled all the world uh, working with canine teams and the military where I trained dogs to search for people, explosives and drugs. Um, after the military, I went back to school where I got my bachelor's in wildlife and fisheries management from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, that's where I studied to forestry and become a wildlife biologist and manager. Um, what some of the ones you can see right here is you have me where I was actually deployed with my working dog, China. Her main goal was to search for people and also explosives, keeping us safe over in Iraq. And then you have me here way long time ago when I was a lot younger. That's my fresh in the military. And uh, that was with my very first working dog, Pasha. Um, I loved her so much. She was just a, an, an awesome dog. Um, and then you can also see me working with uh, college students. And, you know, yes, that is me with Smokey the Bear. Um, he, he is real, I promise you. Uh, that's just his stuff, you know. Uh, I also worked with um, uh, Rudy out in Texas. That's where you can see we are training to look for bugs. And if you look very closely, he's actually got his doggles on. Um, and then I was with my daughter where we uh, like to feed the deer at our old property in Tennessee, just to make sure the wildlife is taken care of. And you'll see at the bottom right-hand side, that's where I was actually working my old job with the USDA, where I was working with soil scientist David, where I was mapping Oak Ridge National Laboratory. That's where they did the Manhattan Project. Um, and I've been working for the USDA for three years. I started as an ecological site description specialist, fancy term for I mapped everything from helping the soil scientists and the plants and the bugs and the trees and the animals and everything. Um, then I came over to uh, the DARD Training Center in Georgia. Now, I got interested in natural resource and um, environmental stuff when I was in high school doing chemistry class. Then I learned more and more stuff about it. And it's just one of those things that it's, it's been my love. And what I love about this job the most is talking to people like you all on how dogs can do their job and how awesome they are at that. But you know what, let's, let's stop talking about us. Let's talk about the dogs. 
Okay, so this is my current canine partner, Bo. He's a two-year-old black lab, and his job is to smell for Mexican fruit fly larva. His favorite toy is a Wubbacong, which is basically a squeaky ball that squeaks on the, when they squeeze it and when they let go of it, so it's extra loud, which he loves. And it's covered with canvas that has long tails, so we can play a game of tug with it. It's a great toy. And his favorite game to play with that toy is Keep Away, where he runs away from me while I try to get it back from him. His favorite snack is liver treats, and he likes running on the beach and dunking his entire head in his water bucket and naps. He's a big fan of naps. And his best friend is Rudy, which is Josh's partner. There we go. And there's Rudy. He is a two-year-old uh, brown and white English Springer Spaniel, and his job is also to smell with the Mexican fruit fly larvae. Uh, Rudy's favorite tennis, uh, toy is actually a tennis ball. He does, he likes the Woba, but he loves the tennis ball. His best friend is Bo. Yes, they are roommates. They, they love to do everything together. Uh, his favorite snack, um, is actually the pepperonis. He does not like the liver treats. Uh, and one cool thing about, uh, Rudy, he was actually born in Haywarden, United Kingdom. He actually traveled all the way from United Kingdom to come work with us. Um, he does like the beach and he loves being silly in his kennel. Um, you know what, let's ask, find out a little bit more how these dogs help everyone, okay? So what are we doing? We are part of the targeted approach to pest control, which Trace was talking about uh, with the, the flying and, and, and dispersal and everything else like that with the pupa. And our dogs can help identify areas where um, circuit control actions would be most beneficial in the fight against those flies. I mean, it's very important. We can provide quick, non-damaging inspections wherever we're needed. Uh, we use dogs to find new infestations on either residential properties or prevent the, um, to prevent the spread to commercial groves and search wildlife finds. The wildfly finds is where they're in a trap like Trace was talking about, and then we'll go out and we'll search that area uh, just to see if there's more that needs to be found. Um, we also help, you know, search farmers markets, you know, that's sure that no infected fruit is sold or thrown away to prevent the spread of the wildfire. Uh, we serve the mission of the USDA in protecting agriculture by using the dogs to help locate the fly larvae hidden in the fruit. So that the citrus industry, it can get healthy fruit to juicers and grocery stores. So this means that dogs are helping out so that you can enjoy that glass of orange juice in the morning or eating your grapefruit on a hot summer day. Now, I think so Jen's actually gonna be able to tell us how the dogs work a little bit better. Okay, so how do dogs actually manage to smell things that have that tiny amount of odor like a fruit fly larva? Now, imagine if you had x-ray vision and you could see the pests inside a piece of fruit without having to cut it open. That's what a dog's sense of smell can do. They're that good. They can identify the infested fruit in a field without damaging the fruit. The dogs can search hundreds of pieces of fruit and identify the few which have larvae inside. They're trained to find the larva of only the Mexican fruit fly and not any other species of fruit fly. So how can they do that? Their dog's ability, our dog's ability to smell is 10,000 to 100,000 times stronger than that of humans, depending on the breed. If you walk into your house and you smell cookies, maybe you can tell they're peanut butter cookies by the smell, a dog can tell you what brand of peanut butter you used. And this is due to how their olfactory centers, the ones used for detecting odor, are structured in their muzzle and in their brain. They have about 30% more odor receptors than we do, which is an average that varies by the breed. When a dog sniffs, gas particles enter their nasal passages and bind to odor receptors. Now, everything in the world is made up of chemicals in different combinations. And every chemical is made of molecules which have unique shapes. You can see some of the unique shapes there in that small white photo. A dog's nose can tell the shapes apart and their brain is specially wired to react appropriately to those smell shapes. So it's kind of like doing a jigsaw puzzle, only you're doing it by smell. Dogs have the ability to locate odor amounts as small as one part per trillion. That's one droplet of water in an Olympic sized pool. And not only can they tell you that there's one droplet of odor in that pool, they can also find that specific droplet for you. And they can do this both because of the number of scent receptors and also because of the way their nose is structured. Their nose is actually divided into two halves with each nostril feeding air into its own side, which has its own scent receptors, allowing the dog to determine which side of their nose has a stronger sense of smell. And that's how they can turn in the direction of the higher concentration of smell. Now, take a second and sniff the air. 
Did you notice that you breathe differently when you sniff? In humans, the air we sniff is also the air we use to breathe, and you can feel your chest expand because it eventually winds up in your lungs. Sniff again and notice the air moving down into your chest. You have to exhale that air before you can breathe again, right? Another amazing thing about dogs is when they're actively sniffing, the air is moved to a special part of their nose with more odor receptors, and it isn't moved down into the lungs, which means that they can smell that specific air longer. So they can pick which air to smell longer. Oh, and the dog breathes in through the round holes in its nose and out through these little slits on the sides. That means that the air going out doesn't contaminate the fresh air that they're inhaling. That's pretty cool, right? Dogs are amazing in many ways, but their ability to smell and their willingness to work with us make them invaluable in detection tasks. All that natural talent and all they ask for is a pat or a ball or a wubbukong. Our job as dog handlers and trainers is to develop their natural talent by teaching the dog which odor they're looking for and show them how to tell us when they locate it. In the case of our Mexican fruit fly detector dogs, they have to be able to tell healthy fruit from infested fruit. We call our infested fruit a target item. It's important that we have fresh live target at all times to train the dogs. Because Mexican fruit fly is an invasive pest, we have to be very careful about how we get them from the lab in Texas to our facility in Georgia where we train. Every project we work on, we first have to work out the logistics of how, when, and where we'll have odor to train the dogs, and even what specifically the dogs will be trained to find. They could be trained to find scat, which is poop, egg masses, larvae, or adult animals of that species. We also have to consider if it's safe to have the target odor item in Georgia, or if the chances of it escaping and infesting the area are too high. In the case of the Mexican fruit fly, we decided the dog should be trained to look for the larva because it's contained inside the fruit and because the lab in Texas already has a sterilized supply of larva for us to train on. So we ship it to Georgia every week. We get some of the sterilized irradiated larva that Trace was talking about. We have a specially designed box that has multiple layers of containment to pretend, prevent any of the larva from escaping. Those, the fruit goes inside those tubes that you see on the bottom right hand corner and the tubes have special screens on them so that they can still get air but they can't escape and they're sealed shut with a cap on the end. We have a permit that details exactly how we're going to transport and store the larva to make sure that they don't get out and that they stay alive for us to train with. They have to be kept cool and comfortable for their long plane ride from Texas to Georgia. When the bugs arrive here in Georgia, we carefully take them out of the box. You can see Josh and I working on bugs there, working out of the fruit. Um, and then we actually have to cut apart all of the fruit and count every single larva. Each fruit is labeled with the number of larva that were put in and we have to get every one of them back out again. And sometimes they've come out of the fruit and they'll be in the tube, but luckily they're still contained by that tube. The larva that we get will be used during the week to make new targets for the dogs to find. We'll cut a hole in fresh fruit and carefully place the larva inside and then seal up the hole again. The dogs can even distinguish a piece of fruit that's just got a hole in it from one with a hole and larva inside. When we train, we have to be sure to include no cut non-infested fruit too, and we call anything the dog shouldn't alert on non-target. And now Josh is going to talk about how we train the dogs to tell the difference. So how do we train the dogs to work? That's always something we always get asked. And then how does that dog search for one specific odor? Well, Officer Jen told you all about that. Really cool. It's a smell thing, right? Yep. So I'm going to talk a little bit how we train and what we have to do. So we teach each dog that finding one specific smell gets them a reward. After we select the dog we will use for a program, they do lots of basic obedience. Training, you know, making sure they're well behaved and they know the basics of their job, like quietly waiting for the handler, riding well in the car, and walking calmly on a leash to get to search along the roadway. Training is kept positive fun. We play lots of games with our dogs. It's like hide and seek with bugs. We train our dogs using positive reinforcement training. They are taught to smell for a specific odor, and when we hear them sniff, we make a click sound that tells them they have found the odor we want them to find. Then we teach them to attempt a trained final response or alert. This is their way of telling us that they have found the target. It could be a sit, a paw, a lie down, a bark, or even a backflip. We've seen it. Then they start getting a reward every time they smell the target item and alert. 
This can be a food treat or the favorite toy or belly rub. Once the dogs are good at alerting on the target, we, on the target fruit, we will put other non-target fruit out there near the target fruit. It's kind of a distractor, so it tells them, you know, what they really need to do. And we only reward only on alerts that on the target fruit that they learn which odors get them paid. Some dogs are more methodical and search slowly like Bo. He does every single one. Then some dogs are a little bit better at scanning and air sending an area to find their target odors, like Rudy, the Springer Span. His breed was designed to scan and air scent, and he's really good at it. I mean, he's really good at it. Makes my job super easy. You remember Jenny when she talked about how a dog's brain is wired to find smells? Well, when we train them to find an odor, they actually grow more scent receptors for that specific smell. So imagine just smelling those cookies all day. Mm, love it. The act of practicing on the odor we want to find them changes their wiring in the brain. It makes them easier to find it. it, makes it easier to do their job. That means they get better and better at their jobs as they practice. And it means we have to do lots and lots of training to keep their top performance. We train every single day. The best way to train is with lots of repetitions and getting them used to each type of search environment. So we have to do it every single time before we move on to the next one. Once we know that they will do great at one part of the training, we move on to harder and harder problems so that they get really good at their job. We train with the dog every day that we are at work. Not all the training is indoor though. Sometimes we work out just physical fitness or agility or obedience. We like to make it have fun. When we work on scent detection, we set up training problems for the dogs to solve depending on what skills that we are working on. We slowly build up their search stamina and vary how much odor they get in each problem. That way they can find a single fruit on the ground or a whole box of infested fruit. We also change the location of training sessions and types of things that they are searching depending on what they'll be doing for their actual field work. So it takes a very special dog to do this work and a long time to train for everything it might encounter in the field. The dog and handler are a team. It's the dog's job to sniff and search and the handler's job to pay attention to everything else. The handler is watching the dog, other people, and the environment all at the same time. The handler is keeping them safe. If you haven't come across a handler, you know, with a working dog, that could be a service dog, a search and rescue dog, a detention dog, a detector dog. Remember, they always have to be able to concentrate. Don't try to talk to the handler or the dog while they're working. It's best just leave them alone. You can't pet them either because they're working. You know, nobody likes to be petted when they're at work. It just doesn't work. Because that gets them distracted and it can be dangerous. Once their work is finished, they might have time to chat with you or the handler might be able to, you know, move on to the next area. So as you can see, some of the areas we train in, you've got Rudy. Yep, he's nose deep in a bucket because he's looking for his bugs. And this is the type of orchard, one of the orchards we search. This was down in South Texas. And then we've got it set up indoors as well, where we do a grid pattern. So we get them used to searching every single piece of fruit. Now, sometimes there's a lot of fruit out there and sometimes there's not, like you can see in this photo. And then, yep, there's Rudy, he found it. He's telling dad where it's at. But like we said, it's not all work. Sometimes you gotta play and have fun. And you got Rudy and Bo trying to go after the Wobo each other. But then sometimes you do have to go to work. And right there, there is me and Bo in Texas and he's searching a farmer's market, like I said before, to make sure that, you know, we, we want to keep the fruit safe for everybody. But let's find out, you know what? Let's find out how we get ar around. Officer Jen, can you tell us that? When we deploy with the dogs, it can be anywhere in the country. And sometimes we fly ourselves and the dogs to where we need to be. Often though, we drive our canine unit to our work location and that's the white truck right there. That's our canine unit. The dogs ride in a specially designed canine truck with a built-in dog kennel in the whole back seat is a dog kennel. It provides a safe and cool spot for the dogs to rest between searches. The truck has lots of special safety features. The tr it has a temperature monitor built in that will alert the handlers if the temperature goes over a preset level. That's the that black and red screen right there. That's the, the temperature monitor. And if the monitor goes off, if the temperature gets over a certain level, the windows will roll down, the horn will blow, and a fan will start moving air inside the vehicle to keep the dogs cool until the handler can get back to the truck. Every truck also has fresh water, a first aid kit, and the safety gear the team wears to work sometimes. The handlers have reflective gear, thick gloves, and snake gaiters to protect us if we need them. 
and the handler will get out and assess an area before a dog is deployed. We look for dangerous things like thorns or wildlife. The dogs have booties to protect their feet and doggles, those are those dog goggles that Rudy is wearing, to protect their eyes. They might also wear a reflective harness so the handler can easily see them if it's getting a little bit dark. And that, like I said, that's a photo of Rudy looking very cool and you can see both dogs in the back with their water bucket in their canine unit. And there is a shot of Rudy giving Josh a little love in the front seat. <laughs> now let's see some video of the dogs in action. Are you ready? Okay, let's do this. Y'all ready? Okay, so this is Bo and I working on finding target fruit with a larva inside. They're in this grid of boxes on the floor. Um, each box has at least one piece of fruit in it. Oops, see, he missed one and I had to swing him back. We circle back to make sure the target isn't there before we move on. And this grid problem trains both the dog and the handler to pay attention because it's real easy to get lost when you're in a big grid. Some of the boxes have those distractors inside, which can be anything from a bag of dog treats, cut fruit, gloves, or papers, or tape. We put in lots of distractors in the boxes to be extra careful that the dogs are searching for exactly what we want them to find and they're not gonna alert on anything else. We train the dogs every day to make sure they remember their job. And you can see Rudy in the background waiting for his turn there. Oh, there it is, he found it, and now he gets his treat. And usually we save the toy reward for the end of the training session because he gets so happy that he gets a little distracted from work when he gets the training toy. And now we're gonna move on to Rudy and Josh training. Okay, so here I'll start the video back right away. So this is Rudy. As you can see before I was telling you, Bo hits every single one. Rudy is super hyper. I mean, he loves to search super fast. But it's one of those we have to go back sometimes. And look, he's telling him, hey, Dad, it's right here. Look, it's right here. And he'll sit and then put his paw in there and tell me exactly which one it was. And he's like, okay, it was that one. Yep, yep, my nose is right there. No, it's that one. Yep, yep, there it is. And then he gets his treat. He loves doing this game. This is one of his favorite things to do because he knows he's going to get his favorite treat. But as you can see, Rudy is a lot better at scanning, and he will walk across, and he's actually sniffing every single box you could tell he knew he didn't sniff that last box so he had to check it and he wants to go to the next problem because he knows where the bugs are at and he wants to get his treats so that's one of the fun things we do with them and there we go and that's rudy being his silliness all righty now we're going to switch back so josh can tell us about how you get a job working a dog Bear with me one moment. So how do you get a job like ours? Well, both me and Jen went into sciences in school. It's one of those that we both did uh, natural resource and environmental type management. Uh, being a dog trainer and handler means understanding biology, anatomy, uh, behavior, learning, theory, and psychology, among other things. Um, to get our specific jobs, we had to have a college degrees in biological science, agriculture, uh, natural resources management, or uh, chemistry. Um, we also have to have an extensive experience training with canines in the detector dog field. Um, so everyone always asks, so what can you do to get this experience? Um, you can volunteer um, at your local animal shelter or rescue. You can raise a puppy for guide dogs for the blind. Uh, you can train your pets and compete in dog sports. That's always very helpful. Um, you can work at vet offices or in zoos to get experience. Um, as an adult, you can uh, join the military, um, the Customs Border Patrol, or the TSA, law enforcement, um, or you can get a job with the USDA working your way up, um, or other civilian organizations that conducts detector dog training and, and detector dog work. Um, there's lots of uh, ways to get it, uh, experience with it. Okay. So, uh, I have just one more thing. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, please raise your paw or type in chat. Thank you. Oh, that was so great. Yes, yeah, so I've been collecting some questions. So we will, um, so we'll start with, so Sophie and Amelia wanna know how old is your oldest working dog? 
Uh, our oldest working dog is actually seven years old, and he's actually getting ready to be retired out. He's actually waiting for Bo and Rudy to finish their training, and then he'll be leaving. Cool. And what kind of dog is that? He's a black Labrador. He's just like okay. Bo. He's a big fluffy dog, too. Yeah. Right. Okay, so Katie wants to know, given all the breeds of dogs that you guys have worked with, what do you look for in a companion dog? Ooh, I'm going to leave this one to Jen. That's, that's her. <laughs> um, in a companion dog, it really depends on your lifestyle and what it is that you're looking to do with a dog. Do you want a couch potato dog? In which case, a retired greyhound might actually be a great choice because while they run really fast, they also really like to lay around on the sofa. Personally, for me, I love a northern breed. So I like a curly tail and pointy ears, which is why I almost always have Akitas at my house. And I also really enjoy a beagle. And I have some a retired beagle and a retired lab that were my former working dogs that live with me. So in a companion, it depends on what it is you want to do with the dog. Cool. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, all right, next. Um, so Anna Lee wants to know, do you train dogs for farmers? Uh, no, we do not train dogs for farmers. These dogs are strictly meant for the U.S. government. Um, we help farmers uh, with, the, with our dogs because uh, both private and commercial farmers, we help them so that we stop the spread uh, of the fruit fly. And then also we get it so that we put their, uh, if they do have a fruit fly uh, larvae there, we put them in quarantine so they can get in and out of their quarantine faster so they can still sell their fruit and all their other types of products. All right. Um, so Laura Beth wants to know, so because Rudy was born in the UK, does he have dual citizenship? He, he is a US citizen. He is uh, an American. Um, yes, he does not have dual citizenship. He is a hundred percent now US citizen. <laughs> Okay, so a couple of people had the question, um, does the Mexican fruit fly have a distinct, it does it, it has a distinctive odor different from other insects? Yep. Yes. Everything in the world has its own odor based on the molecules that it gives off. So those molecules would be specific shapes. So the dogs can tell everything. Dogs can be trained to find just about anything in the world. They even have dogs that they use to find cell phones because cell phones have a distinctive odor because of the chemicals that are used to make them. All right. So I have a question. So where do the dogs live when they're not working or training? So the dogs actually live here in Georgia with us. Um, they have their own separate houses. Um, each dog has their own little house. And then um, during the daytime, they have big break yards. They run around and get to play in. Um, then, like we said, uh, Bo and Rudy are uh, roommates in their break yard. So they get to play uh, with each other all, the, all day long when they're not training with us. Um, and then when it's time to go to bed, they have their own special rooms and they live in the kennel and they get taken care of. And we have a full staff that literally watches over them all day and all night. So yeah, they are very well taken care of. And so when they retire, do they, do they go home with you? Uh, not with me. They can go home to, uh, they actually can be adopted out to um, regular anybody out there. Uh, we have a process where you can, um, apply to adopt a uh, working dog from the center. Very cool. We so have Katie, the option. We have the option of adopting our dogs if we want, but both of us are full with dogs. <laughs> I have three, so I'm full too. I totally get that. So Katie wants to know, what do you do when they make a mistake? So. We positive reinforcement <laughs> training. So for the most part, we just ignore a mistake so they don't get paid. And the dogs very quickly figure out the best way to get paid. If you've had a pet dog, you know, they'll work you to get paid. So our dogs will watch us and realize that, oh, that's not going to work. I'll move on to doing the next thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and Alan wants to know, is there a breed that you can't work with? No, there, there's no breed we can't work with. Um, it's one of those that we choose um, those types of breeds because they are a little bit more uh, friendlier dogs. They're used to people more. Um, it's one of those where if, you know, you see uh, uh, everyone thinks when they see a big like Belgian Malinois or German Shepherd or Akita, they think it's a mean dog, but they're not mean dogs at all. Um, and it's one of those that if you see this tiny little beagle sniffing your luggage, 
it's like, oh, okay, no problem. You know, it's looking for something else, you know, and they always think it's, you know, our dogs look for the bad things, but we look for the bad things because it's the fruit flies, but it's, there's no breed that's typically, that's off limits. Per se. Okay. And um, the Williams family wants to know how long do you, um, oh, hold on. <laughs> I lost my question. How long do you train before, go how long do they train before they go on their first job? We train to proficiency. Uh, so basically we will, in fact, next week we're doing a certification where we're testing to make sure that the dogs are odor proficient. Uh, so they will train until they get the job right. And that can be dependent on their personality. It can be dependent on our schedule. During COVID-19, it's been a little bit challenging to be able to have the training time with the dogs, but we've made it work. Um, so it really depends. It's usually a minimum of 30 days of training before we'll try a proficiency exam. Wow, that seems really fast. They're, they're really quick learners. <laughs> they are. So Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Tyler's class wants to know if those are the only two dogs that you have. Uh, assigned to us, yes, that's the only two dogs that we have assigned to us. We have, uh, I think we're up to over 75 actually in our big kennel. Um, but those are the only two dogs that actually smell for the Mexican fruit fly larvae. So they're the only ones in the U.S. that actually specifically smell for that scent. So right now, those are the only two we're working on more to, uh, to train up. Uh, it just, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, like, you know, Officer Taylor said that we have to get our bugs from Texas, and there's a lot of working and moving parts into getting these mm -hmm. dogs trained. That's really, really cool. So, um, so they're really special. They're the only two that do it. Yeah. Um, so the Williams family wants to know if um, you train dogs for diabetes. No, we, our specific job is only doing with the agriculture and uh, natural resources. We don't do anything with the medical or anything like that. There's other people out there that do stuff with like that, but we do not. Okay, and Otto wants to know how old are they when they start training? We take typically, dogs yeah. a year and a half to two years old. <clears throat> typically we want them to be mature so that their personality is fully developed and that they can settle to the work because puppies kind of have puppy brain which Bo kind of came in with puppy brain and he's two and he kind of still has puppy brain a little bit. He's still a goofball, but uh, we want them to be between one and a half and two. Typically they'll take up to three or four, I think for a special dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then Sophie and Amelia want to know if you have a favorite breed. And I know Jen, you told us that you like the Northern breeds, but what about you, Josh? Okay. So I am partial actually to Springer Spaniels to Rudy and also, um, I'm really partial to uh, full standard poodles. That's like the top notch. They're too smart, but I love them anyhow. <laughs> okay. And Laura Beth said her favorite phrase from the program is the majestic beagle. And then she also said that I missed a question from earlier is what happens if they don't pass the test? Do they keep training and take it again? Um, with that, um, it's, it's different levels. Um, and Jen can talk more about this. They, they, if they don't pass our test, then they go on to uh, they go on to another type of work. And, and Jen can talk more about that. Yeah, typically, if the dog doesn't want to do the work, it, there's a difference between maybe not finding all the odors on the test. In which case, we would train a little bit more if it sh if the dog has an aptitude for the work and wants to do it. Maybe that's on us. Maybe we didn't train enough. You know, there's any number of variables that can happen there. However, if the dog shows that they don't want to do the work, we would find them, most likely we would either see if somebody else in a different program wants them or we would adopt them out. And we do have a whole adoptions program and there's actually a waiting list for that. So like I said, the handlers are able to adopt the dogs, but we do have a program with a waiting list. You can look at the National Detector Dog Training Center website and there's actually a place where you can sign up. Well, that is awesome. Well, I think that's all of our questions. Um, thank you all so much for sharing this with us. And I think what, um, one of the things I love so much about Bug Fest is these intersections we have with entomology, animal handling and training that just makes it so fun. So um, we, I really appreciate you sharing this with us. So I'm going to, uh, oh, hold on, I'm not doing it right. I'm going to share my screen again.
So thank you to all of our participants. Um, of course, Bugfest isn't Bugfest without a Bugfest shirt. So if you have not yet got your memento of our virtual pre, uh, infestation, you can go to bugfest.org and order your shirt. Um, I wanted to, to thank our guests. I want to thank all of you. I also want to thank our sponsors, BASF and Terminex, for making this possible. Um, and that, and um, oh, I forgot to say, if you join the museum or renew your membership, you get a free shirt, so you should do that. Um, and lastly, the museum will be resuming operations next week, September 22nd. So we will be doing free time tickets. So if you um, would like to come, come see us in person, you can reserve your ticket. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Have a great Thank rest you. of the day. Oh, and we have two more full days of programming, Crime Crime Friday and Bug Fest Bug Stravaganza Saturday, not to mention a few more programs today. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.